Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. This, we're very proud of this room, and among other things, it shields you from the rain. And at the moment, that's a very good thing in Manhattan. Uh, I'm Brad Smith. I'm the vice chair and president of Microsoft. And my role here is very small. It is really to, first of all, just say welcome to all of you. I do want to say a couple of words about why we at Microsoft are so excited to be providing a place for this today and to really be part of this very important event and conversation. Um, I think that the Copenhagen Pledge is of critical importance for the future of digital technology and the protection of people around the world. I think that Danish governments and the Ministry of, uh, of Foreign Affairs initiative around, as you see, tech for democracy is extraordinarily important. And we are really proud as a company to join the more than 100 other organizations that have signed the Copenhagen Pledge. I think the Copenhagen Pledge is really very important at two levels. The first is what it says. You know, it calls out the values that are important to humanity around the world, and it really calls on all, all of us to ensure that technology serves those values. But I think the second thing about the Copenhagen Pledge is even more important. It's not just what it says, it's what it does. Because I think one of the real learnings from efforts like this, like the Christchurch call that New Zealand has championed, like the Paris call that the French government gave birth to, is that one needs to use these opportunities not just to bring people together once, to commit to what they believe in, but repeatedly so that we can turn words into action. We've seen this. We saw it, frankly, in this room just two days ago with the meeting of the Christchurch Call Summit. We'll see it in Paris with the Paris Peace Forum in November. We've seen it under the Paris Call with the Paris Call communities. And one of the things that I so appreciate about the Copenhagen Pledge is that there are action coalitions that are bringing people together to turn these words into action. We're really excited at Microsoft to be a participant in two of them. The first is the protection of our elections. And this is just of such fundamental importance for all of the democracies of the world to address. And so we're excited to be part of that. It's why we're launching next week across all of Microsoft's global media properties a global media literacy campaign. This is something, as I've learned, that all of us around the world can learn from the leadership and experience of Denmark and Finland and Sweden and Norway, because I think they've been at it the longest. They've learned the best what needs to be done. But certainly part of what needs to be done is not just advancing media literacy, it's advancing journalism. So part of what we're doing as part of that coalition is to invest in and support investigative journalism and partnership with others, including the investigative journalism that is needed around elections and the protection of them. And then there is one other action coalition that we're part of. This is the coalition that really focuses on protecting and promoting the voice of civil society. And if there's one thing that I think UNGA perhaps better demonstrates in 2022 than maybe any other year in the past, is that the fundamental formula for progress in the world on anything we care about is the ability to bring together civil society, government, and the private sector. It is something that people like to debate. I go to some countries or I just stay home in the United States, and I find that oftentimes what people want to argue about is whether Government should do less so business can do more, or government should do more so that business does less. And yet what we really fail to appreciate is how we do our best work when we come together with role clarity, appreciating each other's strengths, and then frankly recognizing that it's all under the leadership and the regulation of government itself. But civil society, the NGOs of the world, they are the magic that makes the difference. And some of you know that, because I know that some of you work for some of the great NGOs. 
That's why we're excited to be part of the Unmute Civil Society Initiative that the United Nations is sponsoring. It's actually part of the day jobs of a number of people at Microsoft because by the end of this year, we'll have more than 300,000 NGOs around the world using our technology. So the opportunity to bring that expertise into this is just very exciting. So in short, thank you for being here. We're excited to support Denmark, to, just, to support, you'll hear more from Anne Marie, Denmark's wonderful tech ambassador. We're very excited that she lives on the west coast of the United States, and we're very disappointed that Denmark chose California than, rather than Washington State. <laughs> but she's at least in the right time zone. With this, let me turn it over to the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Denmark. Thank you. Oops, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon to, to all of you. Um, I've been really looking forward to, to coming here uh, this afternoon. And thank you so much to, to Brad Smith um, for your warm welcome and also uh, for sharing this wonderful uh, venue with us. And it is my great pleasure to open this meeting. Denmark, um, as been said, is, a, is proud to be leading force in the global effort to make human rights and dem democratic values enjoy the same level of attention and respect online as well as offline. Maybe I'll stand over here if it's better. <laughs> and um, I want to, to thank um, Microsoft and also Access Now for co-sponsoring this event with, with Denmark uh, and our cooperation across government, civil society and private sector, exactly what Brad just alluded to, uh, is a central part of why we are here today. Digital technologies have a global impact in the world today. The future of technology therefore depends on all sectors of global um, society to come, uh, coming together. Here in New York during UNGA, uh, it's natural to reflect on, on how far the international community has come in protecting and promoting human rights, both in the physical but also in the digital world. A digital age, uh, age based on human rights and democratic values requires all of us to take responsibility and to participate in global cooperation. This is exactly the reason why Denmark created uh, the Tech for Democracy initiative last year. And I'm proud on how far we have come, and I'm very pleased that we today can look what lies ahead of us. In just my lifetime, and probably also many of yours, uh, technology has radically transformed many experiences of human life. It affects how the, we communities um, communicate with other people. It informs our understanding of the world. And today, more than ever, people can express their views uh, in many places of the world and also enrich the public debate. However, I think we are all aware of the other side of the coin here as well. All over the globe, authoritarian states misuse um, digital technologies to spread disinformation against their own population as well as against other states. So they're weaponizing what is uh, actually um, is our technology and, and what we developed as a way of emancipating the world. This requires action. We need to build digital resilience against repressive forces. And Denmark supports civil society partners in building resilient civic space also online and we help human rights defenders and digital activists with emergency assistance here. Denmark's uh, Tech for Democracy initiative shows that cooperation across untraditional partnerships is possible. We have come together in new partnerships between civil society, tech companies, and countries that seek to find concrete solutions. We have more than 12 action coalitions are, are take, uh, tackling specific issues within digital development. So let me just give you um, one example. Together with uh, our Ukrainian friends and global tech platforms, we have created a trusted community for uh, Ukrainian authorities and civil society to work di directly with the tech industries. This helped them to tackle the overwhelming amount of Russian-linked disinformation undermining 
news uh, um, and also access to trusted information for civilians. And I was just at the Security Council debate just before coming here, where the, the Russian uh, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs was speaking. And if you listen to what he said, you understand the challenge of dis in, uh, misinformation. So it is important for Denmark that tech for democracy is, is more than just a slogan. The war in Ukraine is a fundamental struggle for freedom, self-determination, and democracy. We must ensure that our shared technological future will build on exactly those values. More than 120 signatories from governments, tech companies, and, and civil society organizations support the Copenhagen Pledge on Tech for Democracy. Um, so a sincere thank to everyone attending here today for supporting uh, this vision for a democratic digital future. And it is um, no um, small part thanks to all of you uh, that are attending here today. You know, I'm, I'm actually incredibly grateful for your partnership, also for your shared belief uh, in the vision uh, of the Copenhagen uh, Pledge. Harnessing um, the amazing digital uh, potentials in digital technologies offer us one of the most uh, it's one, one of the most important uh, questions of our time. We need to step up our joint effort and make sure <clears throat> everyone is heard and involved. So today's session contributes to identifying opportunities for joint action, and I look very much forward to learn and be inspired from you to continue our partnership. I also want to recognize um, in the room, um, as my dear colleague, Foreign Minister, uh, uh, from uh, Slovakia, uh, Slovenia, sorry, um, my dear dear colleague Tanya Fajong, um, and uh, and also knowing uh, how important this agenda is for for you, as we as fellow uh, member of of the European Union. Uh, so thank you for being here with us uh, tonight, uh, to, to this afternoon. And then I want to say finally that when we look in the world today and look at the values that we are talking about, democratic values, human rights, rule-based order, respect of international law. These are values that is contributing to peace and prosperity and stability in the world, but these values are under heavy attack in the world that we are in. And I think one of the ways of fighting back is to not to take these values for granted, uh, because if you take things for granted, uh, you are already starting losing it. It's like relationship between people. So we need to, to step up and be very articulated about uh, democratic values and human rights and <laughs> rule of law. If we are not, then we will go into a much more dangerous world. So thank you so much, and um, thank you to Microsoft for this. It's been, it's been a great pleasure to be with you today. Thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. Thank you so much, Minister, for those uh, encouraging and motivating words. My name is Anne-Marie Larsen. I am the Danish Tech Ambassador. And it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you here in the room, but also to all of you online um, for what is, for me, the most exciting part about my Unga week. Unga feels a bit like a month, so if the last three days have been the rest of December, tonight is Christmas. <laughs> Thank you so much to Microsoft and to Access Now for co-hosting this with us. I do want to recognize, today we're going to hear from a lot of the partners that are part of Tech for Democracy, but we have more than 120 partners now, so if all of them were here, we'd probably be here until Saturday. Um, but do know that this is only one of the many ways that we are spotlighting um, what this is all about. Today, the Tech for Democracy logo is in the Danish colors, and this is the first time I've seen that. That's really kind of you, Microsoft, um, but this is not about Denmark. This is about the collective commitment that we as countries, companies, civil society actors, UN agencies have made to safeguarding democracy, not only today, but so much more in the digital future that lies ahead of us. In the conversations I've been in throughout this week, everyone say, uh, less talk, more action. To me, that is tech for democracy. And so without further ado, um, a little bit about the setup for this uh, wonderful afternoon. 
We will have two panels to hear a little bit about how does this work from some of our partners, what are the commitments, what are the action being taken. Um, we will get to see some amazing things, both a few video of, of some of the many wonderful pledge uh, signatories and why they are committing to the Tech for Democracy. And then we'll see what I think was uh, one of the wildest idea we had in the ministry, at least while I was there, to get an AI artist to help us really think through and transform these quite political conversations to something that engages with the public. So all of that is in store for us for the next couple of hours. But I do want to start on the political level and focusing on the countries that are signing this pledge with Denmark and committing to this. What is the, I think, not only the purpose and the perspective on it, but a little bit from a political perspective, how are you seeing the need for stepping up in this? And so for that, it is my wonderful pleasure to have the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Tanya Falon from Slovenia. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Shirley Butchway from Ghana, was also supposed to be here. The only thing that I think is a good excuse for not uh, coming to a thing is that being held up in the Security Council, especially during this week. But Tanya, please come on stage, um, and we'll have a bit of a conversation. Okay. Please sit here. Okay. Hello. Um, excellent. So, Tanya, I really want to talk a little bit about, uh, I know you previously worked as a journalist, uh, a member of parliament with a focus on the Balkans. In that period, through those roles, what are some of the challenges that you experience um, and how are they either amplified or addressed or challenged by technology? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to this um, very great event and very timely event. As you rightly said, I was a journalist myself for many uh, long years, not only in the Balkans present and in Slovenia, but also in Brussels. And I saw this transformation with digital technologies, how can affect what is happening on the internet and what people can read and what is happening with the fast spread of fake news and disinformation and how can be abused data today, gathering data is gold. Uh, so this is now the most precious what and where you can hurt societies. Just look to the wars in the Balkans, the region where I came from. 20, 30 years ago, we had bloody wars. And there was a huge media propaganda already at that time that people in their countries didn't really know what is going on. We had our families, relatives, all around the Western Balkans. And, you know, I had families in Serbia or in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and once the war uh, was there, people almost became enemies to each other. We closed our contacts because of being manipulated and this fake news or media propaganda was severely abused as a worse weapon to the societies. So we lost contacts. They didn't know what is going on. They had false information. And this is what I say today, yes, digitalization, and it's a great opportunity, but there are a lot of risks if we don't protect human rights, democracies, the values that we stand for. That is why we were with YEPA years ago visiting Amazon, Google, and uh, companies that are having these tools in their hands and it's impossible to globally regulate because they, they go faster than politics can develop. So they have to have their very high moral um, excuse or follow people and societies that they regulate themselves how to protect our values. And being a politician now for the last 10, 12 years, I was dealing a lot with human rights, um, uh, false um, news, disinformation, xenophobia, that all arises with, you know, um, narrative that is very dangerous, nationalistic, populistic, fastly spread through internet. You see governments falling down um, in crisis also because of false information and disinformation. And not even to mention that being a politician as a female or, or a woman, how much that is also another angle where women are also with a narrative of sexism and dangerous chauvinism through social media severely attacked. So there are such a huge aspects of things what is going on on internet. And nowadays I can say in my societies, okay, we had a wars 20, 30 years ago, 
we experience what is media propaganda, we see what digitalization can do, but when once the mainstream media or the politicians start using same tools to manipulate or abuse, this is where it goes wrong. This is when we lose elections, this is where we lose democracies, this is where we lose human rights. And this is what is happening. Now look to the war in Ukraine and the Russian propaganda. They are very effectively, very effectively, in Africa or in third world, using propaganda. There is no war, but the EU, because of the sanctions, is really affecting the poverty in Africa. It's not about the war, it's about the West that is guilty for the suffering in Africa. And this is a propaganda. And this is where we have to fight for. So I could talk lengthily on that, and I'm very worried because I see just myself opening uh, my Twitter account in the morning. I feel like a uh, war is ongoing. You know, it's like a, it's a narrative, maybe 3% or 4% of people are reading. But it's such a dangerous narrative once this ball starts rolling and once the mainstream media or mainstream politicians start using it, it gets really uh, dangerous. Sometimes I feel I, I wish to disconnect from social media because we came too far and we became hijacked with the social media and we cannot control it anymore. Not politicians. We, we cannot control it. If not, the big tech companies are not really taking the lead to protect us from what is there on the internet. And I'm the one that would always say, uh, we need to protect internet, free access to internet, that people can have this precious right to see what's going on, to have an access, to express themselves. It's a great opportunity, but we have to protect us. Thank you, Minister. Um, I heard this, this line the other day that for lies, sky is the limit, whereas um, for truth, they're really bound by reality. And that challenge at times, I think those of us who want a, a more sort of truthful approach to the information we're seeing there, you are, I think, pointing to some of the really great challenges of our time for democracy. Um, we are so delighted that Slovenia has signed the pledge, just like Ghana and a number of really other important countries in this space. Looking a little bit forward, what are you, you know, tell us why you joined the Tech for Democracy and maybe more over um, about, you know, one thing is holding the companies to accountable. What more can we do to advance this agenda and I think feel as if we as, you know, democracies are actually the ones on top of setting the rules of the road? Yeah, thank you. It's true that Slovenia signed, and I'm really grateful for this um, initiative, that it's not a Danish initiative, but it is, but it's a global effort that we have to do. So grateful also to all the companies designed to it and the civil society, because we are, in a way, protecting civil society. Once we end protecting on or offline, human rights is the same thing. But online, we are having uh, huge challenges. If I look to um, education system, this is what I've been in my capacity before in the European Parliament dealing a lot. One thing is responsibility of big um, platforms such as I'm named before Google, um, Amazon, YouTube, name it, Facebook. But another thing is education. I think an awareness, raising an awareness. Because children and people today, they cannot really see what is right or what is wrong on internet. They don't see the proper or the false information. So we have to give them proper education. So this is raising awareness already in the schools that there are a lot of good pilot projects in different, uh, I see countries ongoing, or different media are doing that, or public broadcasters. Especially during elections, I, I do remember France Television did a very good project on TV inside the company. They really developed uh, a team that was just researching fact-finding. And they were just with a team strongly checking all the facts throughout the day, what is coming out during the campaign. And then they were really counterfeiting, giving proper information. And then they also, for the media and the journalists inside the house, they had special rules put in place. Where is responsibility? Where is credibility of information? How to check information to remind themselves through some self, maybe censorship, which is not a proper word, but that they, are, they have a huge responsibility. 
So obviously we all have to, one thing is politics, another are media companies or civil societies. Um, um, I think we have to put a strong emphasis on um, awareness and education of children and really work hard that they understand that internet is a great opportunity, gives a lot of information, but that everyone can also write everything without checking it. That uh, we have so much alternatives, alternative realities on internet. That is for us as human beings, if we are not aware, extremely difficult to know what is right or what is wrong. And for the politicians, as myself, and why I committed to that, is that we tell people, and we lead them with a good example, and that we really raise awareness what is at stake. So I can just say thank you. I very much appreciate. I think it's a joint effort. I always feel that we as societies are some steps behind the technology and the development, because once companies go 10 steps further, we are discussing what could be our measures, and when we develop the measures, they're again 10 steps further. So that is why we have to work hand in hand. Thank you so much. Please give the minister a, a warm hand. Um, again, thank you, Slovenia and Ghana. We'll be also joined today by a few of the other um, wonderful uh, countries that have been working with us in this. I'm now going to turn to the first panel of this afternoon. Um, the theme is on the responsible development and use of technology. And I think it's really important, the development and the use of technology. How do we make it responsible? Because if it doesn't happen per default, it is up to us. And I think that's why the Tech for Democracy and the Action Coalitions is exactly focused on this. How do we do it? Not per default, but by design. We need to ask questions about what is the role of tech should play in the individual lives, societal development, our markets and our opportunities, and balance innovation, security, democratic empowerment. And to uh, come up with the answers of how to balance these three, I have uh, three distinguished um, colleagues and friends, I want to say, like all of you in here of Tech for Democracy. Um, please welcome Paul Ash, uh, the New Zealand's Prime Minister, Special Representative for Cyber and Digital Affairs. Please come up. We also have, a and give him a hand. Um, why don't you sit here? Flavia Alves, uh, who is the Head of International Institutions and Relations at Meta. And finally, we have Peter Misik, who is the General Counsel at Access Now. Please stay. Excellent. So, so good to see you. Um, Paul, I'm going to start with you, if that's OK. So digital transformation has changed daily lives in New Zealand just like everywhere else over the past 20, 30 years. We all agree here some is for better, some is maybe for worse, and some of it we don't really know and probably still have to, to play out. Um, and we saw, not least with the Christchurch, how you know, in the terror of the Christchurch, what happened, really, I think, a negative side of it. Can you speak to how the government of New Zealand is thinking about the challenges of balancing these positive and negative you know, perspectives and taking action and leading in, in that balancing act? Sure. Um, thank you, Anne-Marie. And, and first of all, at the outset, a huge thank you to um, the government of Denmark, to Microsoft and to Access Now uh, for jointly sponsoring this event. New Zealand is um, strongly committed to the work of the Tech for Democracy um, coalition and platform, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. In terms of the way um, New Zealand has thought about digital, I might just talk a little bit about the transformation we're seeing in New Zealand and in New Zealand society. Uh, I first connected to the internet in 1995, I think, in Beijing, of all places, when I was living there. Um, came back to New Zealand, um, and having stepped in and out of online environments in both developed and developing um, countries, was really excited to see um, my government, back in 2008, decide that it was going to invest in broadband, in fibre infrastructure, to the door. Uh, and it was a slightly foresighted um, uh, and um, um, smart investment, in a sense, when we look back on it. Today, we're just on the cusp of 97% of New Zealand households having a fibre connection at the door of their house. And where I live in Wellington City, um, should I have had need for it, and I might have a few years ago when I had teenagers in the house, I could get eight gigabits per second at, 
at my door. Um, that um, might sound like a small thing, but it is an enormous transformation in the way New Zealanders uh, access information and get online. We're just about to see um, two massive data centre regions established in New Zealand, um, building on renewable energy. Um, they will be 100% powered by renewable energy sources. Um, and that in itself also is a huge game changer for us. So the foundations are there for New Zealand society to become completely connected and change hugely. Probably one of the most connected countries in the world. That in turn is having quite an impact on the way we operate. And we saw that, um, you know, the pop we see the positives of that every single day in New Zealand as we look to push out digital services. You can get a passport in three days in New Zealand online. Um, you can register the birth of a child. I became a grandparent this week, and my granddaughter, um, my first one, um, has just been registered online. That's really exciting. You can also register a death online. You can carry out that full process. Our lives have shifted hugely. But they shifted even more hugely in March two 2019 when the Christchurch attack happened. And they shifted not just for New Zealanders but for the world. The live streaming of that attack uh, went global. How many people here um, saw that turn up in their feeds? Yep. And, and how many people here know someone who saw that turn up in their feeds? Pretty much everybody. While 4,000 people watched that event, within a day, um, Meta had to take down 1.5 million copies of that video that were pushed onto their system. And we're really grateful to them for the work they did. They scrambled. Uh, they took down four and a half million copies of that video in the first three months. Um, our, our, our colleagues and friends over at YouTube found themselves watching a copy of the video uploaded once a second over the first weekend after the attack. There was adversarial behaviour there deliberately pushing the stuff out onto the internet. That showed us some of the downside. We saw another big part of the downside earlier this year. And New Zealand may seem a long way away from uh, the disinformation that's being pushed out, um, particularly off the back of the Ukraine, uh, the reckless.